Good morning. And welcome to First Church. It's so good to see all of you gathered together today on what is the very beginning of the most holy week of the year. You might be able to tell by all the decorations around the sanctuary today that this morning is Palm Sunday, that Sunday that we celebrate Christ's triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And we're so glad that you've decided to join us today. If you are our guest today, let me extend a special greeting to you. We hope and pray that the Lord would bless you through the worship of him today and that you might hear a special word from God from Pastor Doug Pratt, who is going to be delivering the message from God's word today. And speaking of guests, if you are visiting with us today and would like to get to know more about us, let me point you to a helpful resource for you. It's called New Here. It's tucked somewhere in the hymnal rack in front of you. Uh, You can find this if you want to fill it out and put it in the offering plate. Or alternatively, you can drop it by either the Welcome Center or the Welcome Kiosk in the narthex just out the sanctuary doors and to the left. If you drop it there, we would love to personally greet you following the worship service. Let me also say a special greeting to those who are worshiping with us online. You will be able to participate and worship along with us very easily from wherever you are in the world. And we're delighted that you are here. We hope and pray that the Lord would bless you in this service as well. As we begin our worship today, I would invite you to locate any uh, devices that might otherwise distract you or occupy your time or embarrass you in the worship service. If you put a cell phone in a nice quiet mode, that will prevent you from being embarrassed and us from having any distractions in worship today. And let me invite all of you to come by what we call our first stop. It's a time of fellowship, refreshments, and information in the large assembly room right across the main corridor called McClure Hall. In there, we would be delighted to greet you following worship and uh, hope that you get connected with one another as well. And let's look ahead at some coming attractions for things that are coming up this coming week. In particular, tomorrow evening is the last of the Pastor's Winter Bible Study. Pastor Alan Walworth and Pastor Steve Clark have been tag team teaching that study on the Gospel of John. And it concludes tomorrow evening. There's refreshments at 6.30 and the main teaching is at 7 p.m. We would love for you to drop by for that. If you haven't already done so, you can come on in. They're intended to stand alone and uh, you'd be blessed by that wonderful biblical teaching tomorrow evening. Looking ahead in the week, on Thursday during Holy Week, we have a traditional Maundy Thursday service. Maundy Thursday, of course, is the time in the church calendar when we celebrate that Jesus instituted the Last Supper with his disciples, and we will have a special communion service with Pastor June Barrow preaching on Thursday evening at 7 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. And then on Good Friday, Friday of this week, we will have a special noon Good Friday service. Pastor Stephen Grant and some other folks will be leading a dramatized retelling of the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. We'd invite you to come back out to the sanctuary noon on Friday, or if you want to stream it from home, you could stream it from home as that service will be live streamed right at noon. And then, of course, we will have our Easter celebration services on Sunday and Saturday night, 5.30 Saturday night, 7.30, 9 at 11 on Sunday morning, when we'll celebrate the best news that the world has ever known, that our Savior who died was raised to new life, and that means that we can be raised to new life as well. We would love for you to join us for any of those services. Just a reminder, our Easter book fair continues this week. Uh, The Easter book fair is the time of the year when we bring all sorts of books into the center that are Easter themed for kids and for adults. We encourage you to stop by the book center and see what's available there. And I'll remind you of our two books of the year as well. Uh, The one is entitled, Is God Real? by Lee Strobel. The other book of the year is entitled, Imagine the God of Heaven by Pastor John Burke. We would love for you to pick up one or both of those and read them sometime throughout this calendar year as a way for us to grow in our faith together. And then let me say a couple of final words about our Easter festivities. This is the last Sunday. If you would like to help us paint this chancel with color by donating some flowers in memory or in honor of a loved one, you can do so at a kiosk in McClure Hall. You can also do so online if you'd like. And we have a special tradition around Easter, which is that there is a resurrection cross on the uh, front lawn of the church, on the west entrance of our facility, that we have a tradition of taking that symbol of death and putting life all over it. If you would like to 
cut some fresh flowers and place it in the resurrection cross. You can tuck it in that mesh anytime next weekend. Uh, we would love for you to help us beautify that beautiful symbol of our hope in eternity that is the resurrection cross on our front lawn. Finally, by way of announcements, let me just remind you of what we introduced to you last week and which you saw also in your mail this week, which is that we have a brand new initiative called the Pastoral Leadership Development Fund in which we are inviting folks to contribute to raising funds that would be a revenue-generating resource for scholarship, mentorship, and pastoral residency. To share just a little bit more about that, I'm going to invite Pastor Emeritus Doug Pratt to tell us what he thinks about this project. Good morning, friends. Uh, what we're doing in uh, raising up and supporting young Christian leaders is, I think, really strategic. Let me just say a word to those of you who are my generation, and many of you have grandchildren. I believe the second most important thing you can do for your grandkids, after first of all being a great grandparent to them personally, is to invest in raising up pastors and leaders from their generation who long after you're gone will be there to teach them the word of God and to help them and encourage them through the challenges and joys of life. Wouldn't it be amazing if watching from heaven someday you get to see a young person you've invested in to become a pastor is the one God uses to bring a grandchild or a great-grandchild of yours to faith in Christ. Wow. It's such an opportunity to impact eternity. The church goes on from generation to generation until our Lord returns. And while we're here, we have an opportunity to help pass the torch. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Well, that completes our announcements for today, and now it's time for us to intentionally turn our hearts and minds from the things that distract us over to worship the one who's given us life and breath and everything else. We have a wonderful service ahead of us today, which will have music from the bell choir, from the chancel choir, from Jeff and Tom and Gabe, and we have a special message from Pastor Meredith Doug Pratt. Let's now prepare our hearts for worship.
It is the Lord who has invited us to this time, to this place, to worship him. And before we knew we were coming today, he knew we were coming today. Our call to worship today comes from the New Testament book of Revelation, chapter 5. And I invite you to hear the Lord summoning you into worship today through these words. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice. They were saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And indeed, we have come to worship the Lord, give all glory, laud, and honor to him. In fact, our opening hymn today is entitled, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. We will be singing all the verses of that. The words will be on the screen, but for now, we're going to be remaining seated because in just a few moments, the children are going to come forward waving palm branches, as is the tradition during this Sunday. So keep an eye out. A little bit later on, I'll invite you to stand and we'll sing together.
be seated. Because of the events of this fateful week in Jesus' life, we have all confidence to approach the throne of grace and speak with our Heavenly Father because not we are worthy, but because He is worthy. So would you join your hearts with mine as we speak with our Heavenly Father? Let's pray together. O Heavenly Father, we give you all glory, laud, and honor, for you alone are worthy of our praise. We thank you, O Lord, that you are good and righteous and that you loved us so much that you gave us your righteousness such that when you look at us, you see the perfect record of your Son, our Savior. Lord, we are so grateful for that. And we're grateful for the celebration of Palm Sunday through which when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, people shouted Hosanna and received him as their coming king. And yet they didn't fully understand what that meant. That you were not only the king sovereign over all nations of the earth, but you're also the king of heaven. And that your glory was not obscured on the cross, but rather made more fully known to us. We ask that this holy week for us would be one in which we sense your deep and abiding presence, summoning us to deeper faith in you. Would you meet with us in this service? And would you meet with us in each effort that we have through the coming week to grow closer in our relationship with you so that when we celebrate the glorious resurrection next weekend, we might do so as a people more confident of the hope we have in you. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, praying the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah. 
So there was a parade, uh, and it was a pretty big deal, actually. Uh, likely, all of the inhabitants of the capital city just swarmed into the crowded streets as the procession snaked its way to the big public square called the temple. At the head of the caravan was a man who was, without doubt, the most popular and maybe even the most controversial person in the country. He was literally riding on a donkey, but figuratively he was riding a crest of a wave of popular opinion and excitement. The people welcomed him in the way that was common in their culture for a visiting dignitary. Uh, they would wave branches and, and uh, spread uh, clothes on the, on the ground as he came by, but kind of a comparable to um, in America in the 1960s when an astronaut returned home from space. Uh, there'd be a ticker tape parade down Broadway back when we used to use ticker tape. Uh, or the confetti that's released from the ceiling at the end of a Super Bowl, or uh, red carpet being rolled out on the tarmac to the plane of an arriving uh, head of state. Uh, these, are, these are the things that we do. What they did was uh, unique to their culture. But uh, with all the excitement and all of this uh, great thrilling parade, there were nevertheless storm clouds of hatred and opposition from his enemies who were threatened by him. They were the political establishment of the day. And those storm clouds, seen on the distant horizon, would soon approach and break with a great crash. Well, that's what happened. It was basically a day of a big parade. And it was a prelude to the really important things that would come. There were events a few days later in that week that were, well, dare I say, world-altering, history-transforming. But the parade was not it. <laughs> there had been and there would be many other parades. This one, well, it basically grabbed people's attention and raised the emotional uh, temperature of the city, but... Uh, it was just the start, which is really not that uncommon. I mean, we see that routinely. Uh, for example, with great dramas, that uh, there will be an opening scene that uh, draw, draws our uh, attention quickly, but there's much more to come. You know, over 400 years ago, Shakespeare, in his magnum opus, the tragedy Hamlet, begins with such a dramatic scene. You probably remember that the uh, uh, grieving young prince of Denmark is uh, walking on the battlements of the castle in the late at night when suddenly his father's ghost appears, directing his son to avenge his murder. Wow, what an opening. I can't say that when I first read Hamlet in 10th grade English class, I recognized the drama of it, but I'll tell you, if a director of a play or a movie does it right, why that is a scene that <laughs> grabs the audience by the throat. And yet, whoa, there's way more to follow. That's just the opening scene. I mean, there's an incredible drama leading to this uh, striking and tragic climax of the play. And that opening scene is just the attention getter. Or look at the series of movies based on Indiana Jones. Do you remember the first one it's called Raiders of the Lost Ark? The intrepid American archaeologist is stealing some uh, sacred statue from a uh, long-forgotten uh, tomb or a, uh, a temple somewhere in the, the, the Latin American jungles. And then as he grabs it and starts to run, uh, the natives are throwing poison darts at him and he jumps in a river and he holds on to the, the float plane as it lifts him away and, Woo, it is an attention-gathering scene, but actually it 
has nothing to do with the plot. Most of the action happens not in the jungle at all, but in uh, the desert, actually, in uh, Egypt as they're looking for the lost biblical Ark of the Covenant. And so we remember that opening scene as Indy is running and the big ball is ro- of rock is rolling towards him. But it's just the start. That's what Palm Sunday is. It does grab our attention, but... Uh, What kind of film or drama critic would focus only on the opening act of of a play or a movie and neglect the really important plot elements that come later? In the same way, we're not going to spend any more time rehearsing the parade because there is so much more important events to come. Why, we've got to go ahead a few days. Now, we're actually going to be reading some words written maybe even a couple decades after the event, looking back upon those really critical things that happened later in what we now call Holy Week. And uh, these are written by a, a contemporary, but we don't know for sure if he was actually there and witnessed the parade or the events that came a few days later. But we do know that he knows exactly what happened. And that with a little bit of 2020 hindsight, he is able to look back and help us to understand the significance of what occurred. So this will be the passage of the New Testament. Actually, the whole New Testament either tells the story leading up to that Holy Week or what happened in it or what it meant to us. But we're going to zero in on a few words from the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 5 is a book that he wrote, a letter he wrote. And here's what he has to say. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's all we're going to think about. You know, in the Kentucky Derby, they uh, put blinders on horses to keep them from being distracted, to look only ahead. Well, we're going to sort of put on some mental blinders and we're going to only focus upon these few words from the Apostle Paul in order to try to understand them deeply and what they say to us. In fact, what we see in Holy Week, as Paul identifies here, I think are three things. Number one, we're going to see a right timing. Number two, we're going to see a role reversal And number three, we're going to see a reassurance of our value. Okay, those are the three things that we're going to lock into and seek to understand. The first thing that Paul talks about is in his words, at the right time. Now we know that there's a lot of history in the Old Testament for thousands of years to be exact, leading up to what occurred during that holy week. Why? Beginning with Abraham, God's plan to rescue and redeem a lost and fallen and corrupted human race and to send a savior uh, to pay for our terrible sins and mistakes. We know that was a part of God's plan and he orchestrated it to such detail with all of the events of the Old Testament and all of the words of prophecy. They all build up. But then we come to what we refer to today as the first century AD, though of course they didn't call it that back then, we do it in hindsight, but historians, even secular historians, can acknowledge that when Christ came to the world, if God had wanted to choose an exact right time to launch a worldwide movement and to communicate it as effectively as possible, there could never have been a more pregnant and ideal propitious moment than what we call the first century, for God to come into the world 
and that message to spread like an out-of-control wildfire, look at all the ways in which it was absolutely the right timing. There was a common government, the Pax Romana, which allowed people to travel across borders without problems. That would allow for the news to spread. Further, travel was better in the first century than it had ever been. Even though it was not as easy as it is today, nevertheless, travel both by ship and by road was vastly improved. People could, could go all over the place. There was a common language spoken by almost all the educated people around the world. It was called Koine Greek or Common Greek. In fact, what a perfect language for the New Testament to be written in so that people of all sorts of different countries around the civilized world could read it for themselves. Actually, kind of common the, uh, to uh, the world as English is today. You know, you travel around the globe and the business people in every major city speak English along with their native language. Well, that's what Greek was, a perfect language for the New Testament. Oh, and then one other perfect timing. By the first century, as we call it, a whole network of uh, Jewish expatriates called the Jewish diaspora were scattered and were living in pockets and communities in almost all the major cities of the world so that when the apostles, who were Jews themselves, would arrive, they would find countrymen, they would find compadres, they would find people who had been hoping and praying for and reading in their book about a coming Messiah and they could then say, here he is and he's not just our Messiah, he's the savior to all the world. In all of these ways, it was just right timing, which should not shock us because this is not the only example we've seen of amazingly good timing. When the right person arrives at the right moment, why even in our nation's history, you don't have to be an expert in American history to know that uh, only George Washington could have held together the ragtag Continental Army through all their troubles and all their defeats until they finally outlasted and defeated the world's great superpower. Fast forward, four score and seven years, for example. Only Abraham Lincoln, we now can see with 2020 hindsight, could have preserved the Union and ended legal slavery. Fast forward again to our own times. In 1981, nobody in the American political establishment and the foreign policy experts had any concept whatsoever except that the future would involve a constant never-ending high-stakes chess game between the Soviet Union and the United States until Ronald Reagan arrived in the White House and said, I have a different view of the Cold War. We win, they lose. Reagan's Oh, he was the only one who so naively thought we could win the Cold War, and he brought it about. Well, there are many other examples. Look all through history, and you find the right timing. It seems as if some outside agent at times has intervened to make things come together just right. Well, that certainly is the case with Holy Week. Not only was it a right timing, it was a dramatic, unprecedented role reversal. In the 1993 film, In the Line of Fire, Clint Eastwood portrays a Secret Service agent. Now, 30 years earlier, when Eastwood was a rookie on the force, he had been assigned as a part of the detail accompanying the president on a trip to Texas. When the shots rang out in Dealey Plaza, that young Secret Service agent froze, was terrified, and didn't know what to do initially. Now for the next 30 years, he has been struggling in his mind. Nope, nobody else, none of his supervisors knew the inner conflict. But this agent, Frank Horrigan is his uh, character's name, is wrestling with the question, can I do it? 
if that moment comes again, can I take a bullet for the president? And uh, not to spoil the film, but at the end, uh, he does what he had committed to do. He was wounded, saving the president's life in an assassination attempt. It's a thrilling picture of sacrifice. And that's what Secret Service agents are trained to do. They are trained to take a bullet for the president. They are trained to sacrifice their life to save someone else. Well, Paul, although he didn't know about Secret Service agents, is certainly reflecting upon this idea when he talks in Romans 5 about, you know, nobody willingly just gives up their life for another. And maybe there could be a case where a person gives themselves in sacrifice for someone else who's really important, really righteous or really good, or maybe somebody really uh, uh, devoted to you like your child or something. You might, at great cost, give up yourself for them. Uh, like, you know, the president uh, being, is worthy to be saved by the Secret Service. But uh, here's the role reversal. He says, but something unbelievable happened. Imagine the president taking a bullet for a Secret Service agent. <laughs> that wouldn't happen. But even astoundingly more significant is what this talks about. God, the president of the universe, took a bullet, died on a cross for you and me. He did it for us, though we didn't have any great dignity that would deserve it. But in an amazing role reversal, he, the great one of all, gave himself for us. And that leads us to the third and final of the points that Paul makes, which is a reassurance of our value of how much we are loved, how much we're cared for, because this is a human need. Oh boy, from the time we are born, we have this need as much as we need air to breathe and food to eat. We need to feel loved. We long for it. We want that security to know that we have value, that we have purpose, that we have, have meaning, and that someone really cares for us. This is what we long for. We may receive it partly or we may receive it abundantly, but we always need it. And life has a way of tearing down our sense of value and security. Maybe it's through things we do that are wrong and the shame and guilt we carry. Maybe it's through people who have rejected us or hurt us or disappointed us. Maybe it's through failure. Maybe, maybe it's through having built our self-esteem and our sense of value upon some role we play or something we do for others. And then when that's taken away, or our physical abilities or our mental abilities diminish, we find ourselves once again asking, do I have value? Do I have worth? Am I loved? We want that. We need it all the way to the final breath of our life. And when we long for that, it is a part of our humanness. We, lo we want love. You know, love is an interesting word. Look it up in the dictionary. Look it up online and you'll find that love is both a noun and a verb, a noun, a thing, an object, it, it, it may be an emotion, or it can be an action, something you do. Which of those two, the noun or the verb, has a greater power? Clearly the verb. You can have squishy feelings for another person, but it's when love is acted, when it's in the words of our text when it's demonstrated the way God demonstrated his love for us by acting in the way he did on the cross. Wow, that speaks so loudly. That reassures us of our value. I have to tell you this story. Uh, uh, you see, I, before I moved here about 20 years ago to Southwest Florida, I lived in a city where a hospital, a medical center and medical school had developed tremendous 
new technologies in the area of transplanting human organs. Uh, it was a real transplant center for the whole world. And uh, these breakthroughs allowed people who otherwise would die to receive organs that would give them new life. And one of the members of the church I was a part of in this city was an, an RN, a nurse working in the transplant unit. And she'd regularly tell me some of the stories. One of them uh, really stuck out in my mind. It was, uh, it was about a, a young woman, I'm guessing late 20s, maybe or 30s, who developed a terrible kidney disease that was life-threatening. Her kidneys shut down. She had to be on dialysis all the time. And uh, she would be for the rest of her life. And even that was no guarantee that she would survive unless she underwent a kidney transplant. So she agreed to have her name and her uh, information uh, for her match and her blood type on the national database of potential donors. Now this young woman, by the way, had been a late-in-life baby. She'd been born to parents who didn't expect her, and her parents were both dead by now. And uh, she had only one sibling, a much older sister. The little sister always looked up to and idolized the big sister, but they were so far apart in age. They were, it's like they were in different orbits, you know. They, they never really had much in common. And then the older sister got a career and a family and moved to the other side of the country and they didn't have a whole lot of connection with each other except Christmas cards and, and the, uh, the younger sister felt kind of alone. Who could possibly be a donor for me? But the older sister got news of the younger one's plight, had herself tested and proved to be the perfect donor and then at great cost to herself, giving up her life, traveling across the country, putting aside all of her plans and undergoing a challenging surgery and recovery, she gave herself willingly that one of her kidneys might be given to her younger sister. And the surgery was a success for both of them. And as the younger sister, the new recipient of the life-giving kidney, was about to be released from the hospital, she shared with the nurse, my friend, you know, I always sort of expected it somewhere in my head, that rationally, that my sister loved me. But now I know it because she gave a part of herself for me. And I'm alive because of her. Wow, what a demonstration. A demonstration that Paul is talking about. On the cross, God demonstrated to remove all doubt that you and I are of great eternal value to him. That his love for us is not just warm feelings, but it's solid. And that love for us, we can take with us all the way to the end of life and beyond because of what Jesus demonstrated for us. Wow, what a powerful message about what is to come this week. We are just on the cusp of the week. This is actually the week. It was exactly, well, We'll give or take a year or two, about 1,990 years ago that all of these amazing things happened, and therefore we just shouldn't let it go by. I don't think this ought to be a normal week. I think we ought to, we ought to make it special. What can we do? Maybe, maybe some of us will feel drawn to... Uh, uh, picking up our Bible and reading one of the four biographies of Jesus, the, the last few chapters that talk about that amazing week. It won't take long, 10 or 15 minutes, and you can be reminded of the story. Maybe you'll want to read another book. Maybe you'll feel led to come uh, to this or another church for a special service as a part of that week. And uh, hopefully you'll be back here on Easter to celebrate. Yes, it'll be a great, glorious time. Uh, maybe there will be some opportunity this week for the truth of what Jesus did for us in the few days that are ahead can really sink in in a deeper way than it ever has. 
And while we will pull out all the stops of celebration and joy and pageantry next Sunday, don't forget, my friends, that the road to Easter leads through the cross. Let's bow our heads for a moment in prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus, it's great to be able to celebrate your triumphal entry to the city of uh, the capital of your people on Palm Sunday. And we do look forward to next Sunday and its joyful celebration of your resurrection and your conquest of death and offer of eternal life. But Lord, we don't want to miss all the things that led up to it. Those things that are before us this week that can be so meaningful and important to us to understand. So we pray your blessing upon each one of us, not just our church as a whole, but each person here, that we might personally celebrate and remember and be impacted by this holy week. For I pray it in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We're going to now uh, move on to the next part of our worship service as we get to listen to Gabe singing this beautiful song about our faith being solidly grounded. And as we hear him, we have the opportunity to worship. The ushers are going to come forward. They have offering plates that will make it convenient for those of you who have come desiring to make a gift to support and sustain the Lord's work. So let's continue to worship in this way.
Thank you, Gabe. As he sang, many people have found that all of their questions, is there really a God, does he really care about me, are answered at the cross and at the empty tomb. Well, we're going to go back now in our minds to the beginning, to this special Palm Sunday, and we'll sing another of the traditional Palm Sunday hymns, Hosanna, loud Hosanna, as our closing song. I invite you to stand as we sing. Before we close with a final benediction, uh, we have a personal message. Uh, if Ted and Ginger Bowl, I don't know where you're seated, could meet Pastor Brad at the front steps here. Uh, he uh, wants to talk to you briefly after this service. Now please receive this blessing in the words of Scripture. God demonstrates his love for you in this, that he gave his own son to be the sacrifice for your sins, that you might be with him forever. Amen.